Hello. Uh, for the past four chapters, we've been looking at uh, concepts and ideas and theories about management and organisation from the HR school. We're now moving into section three of the Colin Kelly textbook. And in section three, the focus is on systems theories. I think whereas the first part of the book focused on classical theories, which were really the first quarter of the 20th century, where they pursued universal laws and general theories about management. In the second section of the book, we looked at the HR school, which is really the second and third quarters of the 20th century. But clearly, both of those sets of thinking carried on throughout the 20th and into the 21st century. But it was around the 1950s and 1960s that our thinking of management changed a bit. And in some ways, to almost contradict some of the ideas from the classical school, but still build on some of the other ideas from the classical school. So we want to explore systems generally and systems theory, which started in the 1950s, which is really about how sets of interrelated parts work together towards a common goal and how that theory can be applied to help us understand management in organisations. There are two chapters in section three. The first looks at general systems and contingency theories, and then we move on to a more specific idea, uh, talking about management information systems theory. And management information systems sort of build on systems theory generally, and were also a key feature uh, towards the end of the third quarter of the 20th century, as we moved into the latter part of the 20th century, but certainly quite a lot of work done around the same period. So we've included it in the same section for now. But let's focus on general aspects of systems theory. And related to systems theory is this idea of contingency theory, and that will come apparent as we go through the chapter. Some of the key outcomes to consider to organise your study and learning are shown on the slide. So systems theory as a general theory can be used to help us understand management and we'll explore that. We also need to talk about different subsystems, parts of the system and what that might mean in terms of organisation. There have been quite a few different theories and ideas about the different managerial and organisational subsystems. So then we want to talk about the contingency approach and all contingency means is something depends on something else. And as we'll see throughout this chapter, and we alluded to it in earlier chapters, there's things about management, maybe management style or leadership style, the way you do things will depend upon either aspects of the external environment, is there also change or is it fairly predictable and stable, but also aspects of the internal environment. And one of the models that we'll look at that explores contingency theory and systems theory in light of the organisation is the congruence model of organisational behaviour and we'll explore that towards the end of this presentation. I've broken the presentation down into a number of slides and also two or three video animations to help you understand what's going on in chapter eight. So the next slide will uh, start us off by really looking at the emergence of systems theory and then we'll discuss that before another short animation. In this session we will review the content of Chapter 8, Systems and Contingency Theories, from Colin Kelly's ninth edition of Management Theory and Practice. In this short animated video clip we will outline the emergence of the systems approach. Whereas the classical school dominated management thinking in the first quarter of the 20th century and continues to influence our thinking, the HR school took a hold in the second and third quarter the systems approach and contingency theories emerged in the third quarter and play a major role in our understanding of management and leadership. Before outlining the systems approach, given that this is a development of management theory, we should first recap major contributions to management theory that came beforehand. Both the classical and the HR school focused on isolated parts of the organisation or management in order to better understand things. Whilst their approach did contribute to our understanding, it also left gaps in our knowledge. Their approach could be regarded as one of reductionism.
In the third quarter of the 20th century, there was a shift of attention from parts to the whole by a number of management scholars. This is a holistic approach based on the concept of holism. The systems concept is a useful way of thinking about the job of managing. It provides a framework for visualising internal and external environmental factors as an integrated whole. In this period, management theorists began to study key elements of organisation in terms of their interaction with one another, and, important, and importantly, with the external environment. Whereas in the past, explanations were in terms of structure or people, this new perspective sought to explain or predict organisational behaviour in a multidimensional way, studying people, structure, technology and the environment as one at the same time. Scholars argued managers are needed to convert the disorganised resources of people, machines and money into a useful and effective enterprise. Essentially, management is the process whereby these unrelated resources are integrated into a total system to attain goals and objectives. Managers therefore coordinate and integrate the activities and work of others, and this is based on general system theory from the 1950s. So a system is a collection of interrelated parts which form some whole with a particular goal. Open systems interact with their environment. The three major characteristics of open systems are they receive inputs from the environment, convert these into outputs, which are then returned to the environment. And a key feature is their interdependence on the environment. Most systems can be divided into subsystems. Think of the human body as an example. This has a number of major subsystems such as the central nervous system and the cardiovascular system for example. Organisations have their subsystems as well, such as production, marketing or accounting. There are interfaces and boundaries between subsystems and relationships between them. Open systems have other characteristics. Feedback enables the system to correct deviations. Whereas the human body can detect pain and move away, the organisation must use information, compare it with its desired state of affairs, such as targets, and then correct behaviour to ensure it attains its goal. Given this information, we are now in a position to redraw a simple input process output model of our organisation as an open system. This is often referred to as a transformational model. When using feedback loops, this may be referred to as a self-regulating, adaptive or cybernetic system. Consider the heating system in an office or classroom. The purpose is to maintain a particular temperature, and there are a number of parts to the system to ensure this is done. Reductionism and holism represent two paradigms, or worldviews, within science and philosophy that provide fundamentally different accounts as how best to view, interpret and reason about given phenomena, such as management in organisations. Reductionism places an emphasis on the constituent parts of a system, whilst holism places an emphasis on the whole system. Thus, they are complementary views that can help us understand management. Okay, let's build the open systems the approach, which is essentially a contingency theory, complemented previous management. So first of all, when we're thinking about organisations and management, clearly we're seeing lots of different parts to the organisation. And we know that an organisation is a group of people with a common purpose to achieve shared goals. So in the video we were really contrasting two different fundamental ways that management theory has been put together throughout the 20th century. Sometimes it looks at the organisation, breaks it down into parts and just studies one particular part and talks about it. Maybe just talking about motivation or just talking about leadership or just talking about productivity and the way that work is organised or things are structured. What systems theory said is let's look at the way that these parts are interrelated in their common purpose but also let's view the whole, not just the parts. And that was the analogy with the bicycle. Clearly, if all you do is look at the parts, you don't actually see a vehicle, something that can transport you uh, as an objective. And so when you just look at the different parts of the organisation, just looking at it in terms of either motivation or just looking at it in terms of leadership or whatever, we don't really see the whole thing. And systems theory helps us to do that. So let's explore that in a little bit more detail. One of the main models to help us think about system theories, again, as I say, where any time we hear systems in any theory, it's a set of interrelated parts working towards some common goal. We know the common goals of the organisation obviously vary depending on the type of organisation, but all organisations, regardless of type, conduct processes, and those processes start with inputs. Some kind of work is done to convert those inputs into the outputs, which may be products and services, 
which are then discharged into the wider environment again. And the environment can influence any part of the organization system because the organization operates in an open system. So inputs can be people, materials, uh, raw materials, and all kinds of different things like that. And really the conversion, the transformation activities are the work processes that go on. Now, if we had a microscope in front of us, this view that we're looking at right now would really be with the lowest degree of zoom so that we can see the whole thing. As we zoomed in, we'd probably break that transformation process into lots of smaller processes and even smaller processes still. And there'll be lots of different processes in the organization involved in transformation. And we'll look at some of these later in the book. So we've talked a little bit about system theory. System is a set of interrelated parts working in a broader environment towards some common goal. And I've provided a couple of different models to help you uh, conceptualize what those systems might look like as a simple diagram. Maybe what you could do is just pause the video for now and either individually or in your groups, you could apply systems theory and see if you can just brainstorm the different component parts of something like a heating system. Obviously, the heating system will also cool things that may exist in an office or classroom and see if you can first list all the different parts, then think about the relationship between those parts and see if you can draw a simple model of what that might look like. And in your model, do bear in mind, we said that it, the whole system was not just about inputs, process and outputs, but also include feedback loops, which were used to control and govern the system so that it became a self-regulating system. So have a go at that after you pause the video and then restart the video. And maybe the next uh, animation slide will show uh, what uh, that diagram might look like. So models like this are just abstract conceptualization diagrams that help us understand something. They explain something, help us get to the meaning of something. And we'll see later in the presentation some further examples of models applied to the organization. And later, looking at other chapters in the book, you'll look at other kinds of model, perhaps things like business process and business process maps that also explain the work activities going on within the organization. So one of the simplest models, the transformational model that we've already mentioned is shown here, and it really does 
emphasize this idea that inputs coming from outside the environment therefore it's an open system and the environment itself controlling what's going on inside we've got the conversion work activities the transformation activities typically happening in production and marketing and other parts of the organization to create the products and services and we get feedback loops that govern all of this so if you imagine applying this kind of model to an organization you could imagine an organization with a target to produce 50 units of something and as it creates those units the products will be rising in number and if there's an information system that tracks how many of something is being made say we want to make 50 in a day we're counting how many is being made and then we use that as feedback and compare it with what our target is of 50 and if we're not making 50 a day then that might trigger some corrective action to make more or if it's making enough then we may need, not need to make any more so we use information and feedback loops to put control into the whole process and we'll talk more about control later in the book <laughs>
Okay, so that was an overview of the five subsystems that work as viewed by Katz and Khan. There are many different viewpoints of what the subsystems at work are, and it does depend on the nature of the organization. So don't just rely on this view. Uh, there are other ways of thinking about the subsystems at work. So moving on through the chapter, uh, a number of models based on the system paradigm are presented. We're going to present a couple more here. Uh, and this is the 1965 model by uh, Levitt. And in his model, he really thinks of the key components uh, of the model as being those about the work task, the work itself, those about the people in the organization, the technology they use, and all of the different aspects of structure that bring those things together. And as a model, again, this helps us understand the organization more from a, a holistic perspective and think about its overall purpose and the relationship between these different parts. But the model itself um, did lack a number of things. It didn't consider the organization as an open system, the wider environment, and some of the other inputs and outputs associated with it. So the organization doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are forces from outside that govern what's going on within and can influence what's going on within the organization. And this led to the development of a further model, which really built on the original uh, model that I just showed to you. But it then also recognized uh, the role of the broader environment. And it says it's a congruence model, which basically means it's a contingency model. And it's saying that those activities within the organization in terms of structure, people and work is dependent on the external environment, but also on the internal environment. So organizations look at the external environment. We'll look at strategy later in the book, but they look at, you know, things like the needs of the environment uh, in terms of products and services and in terms of the economy and people and other things. And they translate what's going on in the wider environment into their own strategy, their own purpose, mission, a set of goals and plans to deal with that. And it's that strategy then, uh, how we'll get competitive advantage, what we'll do, what our purpose is, that will then govern the internal components in terms of work, people and structure. So they're dependent on the strategy, which is dependent on the environment. And that's where the word contingency theory and congruence model come from. And as a result, the outputs will then follow in terms of product services, but also other aspects of behavior in the workplace. So the whole thing is a model in that it's all a set of interrelated parts, but it's not just about the internal parts, it's also the external aspects as well. But you can read more about the congruence model in the chapter. So we've been talking about these broad philosophical world views in terms of holism and reductionism. We've talked about much of the earlier part of the 20th century management thinking being more reductionist and then starting to think a bit more holistically. Uh, and so it'd be a good idea at this point to reconsider the vignette at the start of the chapter. Again, maybe pause the video, discuss it with other people that are also studying this book with you and share some ideas and thoughts about it. So the chapter does cover quite a lot of things. It blends together the basic ideas of systems theory, a set of interrelated parts working towards a common goal with open system in terms of the role of the environment, and then talks about contingency theory that some things determine other things or are dependent on other things or contingent on other things. So environmental determinism says the environment determines aspects of the management variables. And this high level sort of general model tries to break that down a little bit. It says we need to think about the broader external environment uh, in terms of how it might shape what's going on within the organization. And that's through strategy, as we indicated earlier. But also you have to think about the internal environment, the context within the organization, things like its size, other factors such as its age, the technology it uses, the culture. All of those things will shape management variables in terms of management and leadership style, the structure, uh, of the organization, uh, practices and procedures, and a whole host of other things. And collectively, they will then uh, have a, 
had impact on, determine or relate to the performance of the organization. And if everything's aligned, then the argument is you'll get better performance. But these are models to help us understand the organization and therefore to help us understand leadership and management within it. So hopefully you've read the chapter now and I've got a couple of multiple choice questions for you to think about. The first one's on the screen. Take a few seconds. Do you think it's A, B, C or D? And the correct answer is A. And we've contrasted reductionism and holism at a number of points throughout this video presentation. Another question for you. Select A, B, C or D. And the correct answer was C. If you got any of those wrong, maybe you could go back and read over those sections again. Other things to help you consolidate your learning, particularly about systems and contingency theories, you could attempt the various questions at the back of the chapter, either write a lesson plan, an essay plan, or write um, a whole essay, depending on how much time you have available. But remember to try and demonstrate critical wider reading and thinking in your answers. Try and support any arguments that you make with references to theory. That's by making various citations, not just to this textbook, but to lots of other textbooks and also relevant journal articles. And there's some suggested further reading at the back of the chapter. So we've come to the end of this session and there's a quick recap on this slide. So generally, many aspects of systems and contingency theory complemented other theories, saying that, you know, that our management and leadership styles that we've talked about previously depend on the situation. So how do we adapt and develop them to the situation and the context? But in some ways, also systems and contingency theory really criticised aspects of earlier theories. So, for example, when it came to classical theory, pursuing single general universal laws of management, it said, no, you can't have those. The way that you manage depends. You can't have a single general best way to manage. It does depend on the situation. If you're managing in a dynamic environment, there'll be things that you do that won't be the same as if you're managing in something like a predictable environment. And there was plenty of discussion about the role of the environment in the chapter. But that's pretty much everything I wanted to cons uh, consider for now. And I'll see you probably in chapter nine.